Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Open up your Bibles to Judges chapter 3, please. In this passage, we know, if some of you have read your Bible, that the children of Israel, they lost a great leader named Joshua. And it was a time of judges where they had to fend and fight for themselves. A lot of you know this story. This was the beginning of the cycle where the children of Israel kept repeating the same pattern of sin. And they refused to go out to war. They start to compromise and settle down with the world. And I see that very much depicted in our world today. We live in a generation where there is a spirit that wants to unite, a strange spirit that wants to not fight, a strange spirit that wants to settle down. But you have to understand the Holy Spirit, he always rightly divides. He believes in separation. We believe in fighting. But we live in a day and age where it's called United Nations. It's called world peace. It's called the new world order. We live in that day and generation where basically people want to get along. That's why churches refuse to fight and they settle down. And thus you got a movement called the ecumenical movement. You get churches becoming non-denominational. Mega church pastors. Churches that refuse to put the name and the denomination of their church. But instead just saying community something church. The reason why we live in a generation nowadays that does not know war. Look at Judges chapter 3 and verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only in that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing, Thereof. Now, I'm going to read from Judges chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through uh, uh, 12. That will be our entire passage that I'm going to preach one by one today. And you're going to find out that they get delivered uh, by the Lord after they committed sin and let him down many times, and God gave them up to their enemies. And then the Lord raised them up a judge to deliver them. And then as long as that judge lived, the children of Israel lived peacefully and right with the Lord. That generation, when I see this pattern, it's very much like our pattern today. The reason why the world has fallen into apostasy in your life is filled with discouragement, misery, and apostasy. You have some sins that you refuse to give up or some things that you're struggling with in your life. The reason why people commit suicide, people give up on life and forsake the ministry and compromise with the world and settle down is very simple. You are a generation that does not know war. That is the bottom line. All we're thinking about is prosperity, settling down, being comfortable, what makes life good for me. But you have that immature mindset. We are completely in an immature generation. Every single one of you are in a generation of immaturity. Every single one of you. Unless one of you came out from World War I. Every single one of you are an immature generation because we think that the, the vehicles we drive, the homes that we live in, the cheap amount of money that we're able to pay for a good amount of food and everything is a given in life. But it is not a given in life. We must understand that every cycle, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, this is the law. When you study history, when you study societies, is that society can go only so much farther along with prosperity without, uh, with prosperity without sacrifice. Right. There has to be payment in order to enjoy something in life. You can only go so far. It doesn't last forever. People have to be willing to lay down their lives and shed blood and do something themselves to finally keep the prosperity, to keep the happiness in life. But we don't think that way. We think that uh, what we have is a given. We deserve it. And why don't we get more? That's a generation we live in. And then when something bad happens in life, we live a victim mentality, a victimization, saying that, uh, oh, something's bad in life, or this is too hard and too difficult. You don't know what difficult is. You are a generation that don't know war. That's why. 
take a child from one of those villages to uh, 4,000 years ago, it was common sense that they had to go out, hunt for food, and if they don't go out and hunt for food and they can't find prey and animals to eat, that they have to just uh, stomach it out and they just have to endure through a day without food. And there were children as young as 12 even that would go out hunting for food. There were children who were mature more than 40-year-old adults today. You know why children would get married young back then? You might say, wow, that's just too extreme. You know why? Because they were already prepared for marriage, prepared for living and income, and they were, will and they were prepared for that, what villages had, that right of manhood, they would do it. That passage of manhood that the child would go through. And they would train the child and then uh, tell the child what to do to prepare in life. That's why 12-year-olds would get married that young. You know why? They knew about maturity. They were willing to sacrifice maturity more than grown adults today who are 20, 30 years old and they're still wandering around not knowing what to do with the rest of their lives. Come on, Pastor. That's a generation we live in. We don't know war. We don't know war. I hope today's sermon will be incredibly eye-opening and helpful to you. The title of my message is, Our Generations Don't Know How to Fight. Let's pray. Father God, uh, this sermon is for not just grown adults, it's for uh, even the young people as well. I mean, when I study history and when I look at your word, there were people who were as young as children, like Josiah, who knew the responsibility of adulthood. And we got teenagers, we got young adults, and yes, even married grown-ups, and God forbid, people who are senior age, acting immature. And they don't know how to fight. All we are in is trapped in a cycle of victimization. And we don't learn to make sacrifices and take up accountability, responsibility ourselves. Get us away from our Xbox system of our mindset that we are addicted in, Heavenly Father. And get us to face the outside world and reality and be willing to make sacrifices. Even pastors... Bible believers today that we consider to be strong, they're immature as well, Lord. They think that the mission work and the ministry is too tough. They don't know what tough is, Heavenly Father. We don't know what tough is. Our generations have forgotten, our hands have forgotten the feeling of holding a sword. May you convict us today and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. The Bible says, now these are the nations which the Lord left. To prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. My first point is our generations forgot their assault. Now, I didn't say apologetics. I said assault. Our generations forgot their assault. Now, look, apologetics is a good thing, but our Christian generation has got into an apologetics mindset where we're constantly defending, 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 defending. And we forgot our assault mode, our attack mode. You wonder why these liberals are demon-possessed and going all, all out? They're doing their assault mode. Christians are not. Christians have refused their assault mode and instead thinking about settling down with the world, compromising, going down, and adapt culturally to the generation so that they can win them to Jesus Christ. And that's why they have to have gay Hillsong music all the time. And none of those people would even know how to hold a sword or, de or even quote one verse for Jesus Christ. That's the generation we live in today. They forgot their assault mode. You forgot your assault mode. You think that it's a given in life that you, you get job, you get paid. You go into a school and get a degree. That mommy, mommy and daddy should feed you and care for you. That you think that, well, because I've done all this work, it's a given, I deserve just 
rewards. So I'm an American. I worked hard and I should have my house and I should have my vehicle. I should have these possessions. Be able to afford things at a cheaper price. Why are taxes going up? And then why are prices going up? I'm grumbling and complaining about six dollars pumping in six dollars in a gas tank you know the problem is that our mentality is it should be a given that we pay one dollar for gas it's a given that uh, we should buy food products that are cheap because why i'm an american this is america god proved what america was capable of yeah. went down real fast to hell you know you forgot your assault mode when trials and situations happen in life We've got to learn that this is normal to make sacrifice. And when the devil comes in lashing out at you, that's not the mindset of, oh, I can't take it. When's the last time you've learned, I've got to fight? Yeah. When you fight, you're supposed to feel pain. When did, when did the Bible ever say that when you fight against the enemy, you're not supposed to feel pain? That you're supposed to get some steroid and some power to overcome the devil. What made you think that way? It costs suffering, blood, and tears to fight. We forgot our assault mode. When's the last time that uh, now, God forbid, we're in a day and age where what you think is a trial is not actually a trial. What you think is a hardship is not really a hardship. That's the day and generation we live in today. Why? Because when's the last time you fought really hard before? When's the last time you fought really hard before? Have you ever fought? Have you ever went assault mode? Or have you always went to the adapt mode? Settling down with the world mode. Going in with defense, 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 running away mode. Everyone does that, running away mode. Trying to find something else to fill in the sacrifice and the pain. Alcohol, smoking, worldly friends, money. You're all, you're all running away defending Christianity. God forbid the preachers today, they have no unction from on high. Just intellectualism, talking smooth like R.C. Sproul, and every pastor wants to act like R.C. Sproul and Ravi Zacharias. Look at, look at what happened to Zacharias with his scandal at the end. There is no assault mode. And you know what? The ones who are probably the only ones doing the assault mode are jerks who are street preaching and those who want to try to, who, who are rebellious against the authoritarian government that we're at, and they're trying to go all out. Those are the only two people, and yes, they represent a bad testimony to Christianity today, but you know what they have? They have an assault mode and you don't. They have an assault mode and you don't. You're just scared all the stinking time. And you refuse to get up, pick up your sword, and fight for Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not telling you to be a bad testimony like these two groups, but man, you weren't bold enough to just go to that soul and say, hey, I want to tell you about how to get saved. Amen. A lot of people, you, you get offended when the preacher calls out your favorite preacher and attacks the preacher and you go, don't attack the person, attack the sin, attack the wrong doctrine. Where's your assault mode? We live in a sissified generation. I get more disgusted and disgusted every time I see comments online and the spirit of these people. It grieves me to my soul that these people have lost their assault mode because they think about getting along with everybody, being nice with everybody. Where's your assault mode? When's the last time you learned how to fight? Are you going through a loneliness situation? When's the last time you learned to fight? When's the last time that you've learned how to fight depression, misery, sinful addiction too strong for you? Why are you running away from it? Why don't you fight it? You know, I, you're so used to being born and raised into being a given mentality. That's why people go to a socialist government. Given mentality. Give me, give me. You forgot your assault mode. Verse 2. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Why did this suffering, this hardship had to happen? This war had to happen. You know why? You knew nothing of war. Amen. So God's giving you war. Praise the Lord. You have no idea 
about fighting pain and struggle. Oh, why did this have to happen? Why is it that people made fun of me as soon as I attended Bible Baptist Church and then my family's leaving me, calling me a call? Why did this happen? Because you never knew what war was like of people criticizing you for being a Bible believer. Oh, I did visitation and then the person looked down on me. I made a mistake. This is so difficult and oh, it's so hard. You know why? You never knew what it was like to fight fear when you were soul winning. That's why God gave that to you. Oh man, why did this health problem happen? It's so hard to serve God. It's affecting my mood, my thinking and everything. You know why? You never experienced that before in your life. That kind of a war of health problem. So God gave it to you so you can start learning. You know what the problem with you today is? You refuse to learn from that. That verse says that when God gives them war, it's to what? That verse to teach them. Amen. You know what that suffering, that trial is meant for? To teach you. Preach. To teach you. It's done to teach you. I don't know what kind of sinful struggle you're going through or a trial that you're trying to battle with or something in your life that you find to be very difficult to overcome. But God promised he won't give you a temptation greater than you can bear. And the evidence is you're still alive today. You're still here in this church. So then when God is giving you a burden not greater than you can bear, what he's doing is he's training you so that, hey, because when the fight happens, when the big one comes, I want you to be ready and overcome it with joy, with joy and with peace. But some of you don't know the meaning of Still holding on to joy and peace while fighting. You don't know what that means. You only find joy and peace in prosperity. That's it. Fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. You're that generation that don't know war. So you know what I would do if I were you? Every painful experience that I went through, I will search my heart and say, what do I need to do to get right with God? What do I need to do to... Uh, mentally train myself to have the right thought with this problem that I'm going through. What is my stress management tactics? I need to learn that. What's it like to hold on to pain, unbearable pain, and I'm going through an existential crisis or whatever you want to call it, and to be able to keep going on for the Lord. What does that feel like? How can I sense it? How do I overcome it? Simple child, when God gives, it, gives you that experience, but you're wasting that experience. Every experience that God has given to you, you wasted it and ran away from war. That's my second point. Our generations forgot their awareness. Our generations forgot their awareness. You're not aware of every time God's teaching you war. You know, you hear preaching all the time on some of the things, how to overcome sin. But you forgot that. Yep. That was your training ground, your battleground. But no, you don't attend the one-by-ones. Wow. You don't attend the Saturday discipleship, or Wednesday Bible studies, or the Sunday teaching, or Sunday preaching that the Lord gave to you so that you can fight. But you just happen to miss out. That's why, personally, for me, this is just me, I'm not saying all of you, but for me, I don't believe in skipping Sunday church. I don't believe in skipping church. Because why? It is my chance to learn war. Every time I miss out, I miss out an opportunity to learn how to shoot a gun and to overcome an enemy. You forgot your awareness. You haven't been reading that book. And if you don't read that book, and some of you are like, why is doctrine a big deal, Pastor? Why are you cutting down everybody who doesn't teach right doctrine? The reason why is because how can you learn how to fight a battle without something right to learn? That's why you need right instruction, right guidance, right doctrine, so that you can have the right learning and learn how to fight next time. But you forgot your awareness. Some of you aren't learning. Some of you don't think Bible-believing doctrines are a big deal. It's about time you... If you attend this church, there's one thing you know. We take doctrine seriously. It's about time you start to take it seriously too. You need to be aware of... You need to be aware. Christians are not aware. We live in a, the most, one of the most ignorant generations I ever lived in all my life. One of the most ignorant generations with technology rising up sky high and brains being so fried dead. And then we live in a day and age where we forgot to be aware 
of our own existence, our own well-being, our own issues that we refuse to see because we're a spoiled child saying, give me. Come on, helping us. Worse yet, you're dependent on someone else wow. to, give, to give you. Right and that becomes far, far worse. You need to be aware of your own issues and learn that you fight for yourself and that not somebody else does the fighting for you. That's why it's so easy to depend upon government. That's why the whole world is falling to apostasy. They're dependent. College students say the most stupid things to you nowadays. Why is that? Because they're dependent on what they've learned from their school. That's their dependency, their haven of rest. So they, they're not afraid with what they do. They got Hollywood backing them up. The media backing them up. See, they're so dependent on them. But take those things away, they would be a crying child sucking on their thumbs. We live in that generation. You will be a mind control slave dependent on something to fight for you. But you got to learn to fight your own battles. You forgot your awareness. Let me ask you this. If you learn how to conquer a sin, if you learn how to defeat your depression, if you learn how to, when a trial happens, how to get over it, or there's a fight going on within a family, or a disagreement and a dispute going amongst Bible believers, fellow Bible believers, have you learned how to fight against that, how to overcome that? Do you say that you have the answers to solve it? If you don't, you don't know war. You need to learn how. We are a generation that forgot war. And God's trying to give you that teaching opportunity every time in church with this trial that he's putting you through or the reading of his word, but you blocked it all out. My third point is our generations forgot their adversaries. Our generations forgot their adversaries. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. Notice that the Bible says, namely, italicized. I believe that is... Uh, part of inspired scripture. You need those italics. Amen. Amen. Why? Because it's going to give something important. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and, all the, si and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. What's the point of this, Pastor? Those generations forgot who their adversaries are. And I like how the italics says, the italicized word, it says namely. You know, my point is this. You forgot your adversaries. You forgot your adversaries that you refused to make out a spreadsheet or a list of names that you can point out, this is my enemy that attacked me with this problem. I remember such a place in such a time, this situation happened, and it discouraged me. It almost made me uh, leave church, and oh, I got to remember that. Name that. Mark it down. Write it down. Name that enemy. Amen. But you don't name the enemy. And that's why Satan's going to repeat that pattern again and take that back. And then you forgot. You forgot about that. And the devil brings that back up again and say, okay, it worked with him or her before. I'm going to use that same enemy again to defeat that Christian. And that Christian gets defeated again. You know why? That Christian forgot to name the enemy. You need to put names on your enemies. Some of you think that you live in a world of, oh, this is such an easy life, prosperity. The past two years taught you a lesson. You got to realize that you have to make a list of enemies in your life. There are weaknesses that you have in your flesh. There are enemies out there in the spirit world that has constantly given you the same temptation over and over again. And you need to put down the names of those enemies and say, I have a problem with bitterness. I have a problem with jealousy. I have a problem with, uh, uh, with lust. I have a problem with wrong imagination. I have a problem with bickering and fighting. I have a problem with pride. I have a problem with knowing so much that I'm prideful. I have a problem refusing to accept shame if I'm wrong. Pride. Pride, 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 pride. Every one of you should put pride as the enemy. You forgot the names of your enemies. You need to name your enemy. You need to name it to the point where you write it down, the exact feeling that you felt, 
the exact incident that happened, what were the precursors that led to that enemy coming in. You need to write it down and name all of that. You need to name all of that. You need to name all of that. Name the enemy. So, the more specific your naming is, the more you can identify your enemy. The more specific your naming is, the more you will identify the enemy. It's like, for example, where uh, fornic fornication may be that enemy of yours, but, uh, you did, but you need to name it more specifically where it's, oh, it's, bottom line is I hung around with worldly friends. That's what led me to that enemy. Worldly friends. And then you need to name it more specifically that you go, oh, it's because I made this wrong decision of getting away from church and going to college because I need to think about my life and my career. And then you need to name that enemy more specifically and go, I choose my future security than Jesus Christ. Future security is my enemy then. You need to name your enemy. You need to name it and name it and name it and name it. Preach. Notice that the scripture at verse 3 didn't say, you know, just uh, all the Canaanites. At verse 3, you see that? It didn't just say all the Canaanites. You know that? God's like, namely, Amen. five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites. See, God made sure, I'm going to name every one of them that you're supposed to fight and wipe out. Preach. That's why our generations don't know how to fight. They've forgotten the names of their enemy. And instead, what's worse is, at verse 4, the Bible says, and they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. My fourth point, our generations forgot their aspiration. Our generations forgot their aspirations. When God sent those enemies, those adversaries to Israel, it was to prove them, to prove if they, they recognize what they truly aspire. Is their aspiration in everything truly God following the Lord? It didn't turn out to be that way. They forgot their aspiration, and because of that, that's why they fell away. These Jews did not know how to fight because they don't have an aspiration, the right aspiration. You know why you're going to fight? I'll tell you what you're going to fight. If there's something that you have a goal, something that you have an aspiration, something you have a strong desire, a strong devotion to, if there's something of that in you, you're going to fight with all your might. An easy example that everyone does is if someone is putting your head underneath the water and you're suffocating to death, guess what? You're going to fight to get up out of the water and get breath of air. You know why? That your aspiration, your whole desire that you're fighting for is air. Air. None of you have that in your life. That's why you don't fight. There's nothing that's your aspiration, a strong desire. Think about it. If God was truly all their aspiration, wouldn't they fight even the smallest sin? And they would fight even for their own children not to get into the smallest sin or watch the smallest sin or hear the smallest sin? They would put up a fight and not think about, oh, it's just too hard or, uh, you know, it's, I'm just so tired, I can't do it anymore. Not if you're underneath the uh, water and drowning to death. No, you're going to keep going, ah, ah. Yeah. You're going to fight all your might and keep pushing no matter how tired you are. You're going to keep pushing and pushing and fighting and fighting. I need to breathe. <laughs> but you don't have that kind of aspiration in your life. If God was truly your all in all, a holy God, a holy God, where it's purely Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Then anything of this world you're going to fight against and put up a fight and not say, Christianity is too hard, I quit. You're going to put up a fight. But you don't have the aspiration. Jesus ain't your aspiration. That book ain't your aspiration. And God's going to prove it one day when he takes away that book from you when the Bible gets illegal. 
And God is. God has banned, allowed this country to ban things one by one. You didn't think that those rules, those morals are important to you, so ban the Ten Commandments. You didn't think prayer was that important to you? Ban prayer. You didn't think church was important to you. So what did God do? Switch it to apostate churches. And, and guess what happened two years ago? Ban churches. Yep. Yep. See, God will take it away from you because you don't really care about that after all. And here's something big. The verse says, in verse 4, unto the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers. Notice that there, if the Jews really had their aspiration into their God, what's associated with their God is also their people, their family, their entire community of people. You know why you don't fight? You don't have people around you that you really love and care for. If you have children that you really love and care for, you know what you're going to do? You're going to fight all your might to protect them from the world, to spread extra love to them, extra time for them. And even though you're busy or all that and tired and it's such a wicked world and television has brainwashed everything, you're going to fight with all your might to protect that precious child of yours. If you really loved this church so much, you're going to fight with all your might to pray for that soul to come back to church, to go up to that brother and sister and welcome them and support them, to encourage the pastor when he feels down so that he can keep preaching and keep the church going. Amen. You're going to fight with all your might. But people don't fight. They give up on their church, and that's why they skip church. People give up on their families. That's why they let the kids do what they want to do in life. And then every generation does that. We live in a generation nowadays that has forgotten war. That has forgotten war because they have no people that they truly love. If there's someone that you greatly love, you're going to fight with all your might. Well, oh, I don't care and everything can go the way it is. Then you have, then I pity you. The only person you love is yourself. You, have no, you don't know the meaning of true love. You don't have someone that you greatly love. A person you love that you would fight for that person and willingly lay down your life and burn yourself out for that person. That's why you don't fight. You don't love. You don't really love this church. You don't really love God's, your brother and sister in Christ here. You don't really love your pastor. You don't really love your husband. You don't really love your wife. You don't really love your parent. You don't really love your sibling. And guess what? You're going to soon find out you have no one to love except yourself. That's why you don't know how to fight. You're so used to me, 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 satisfying me, and it's just my flesh that I love. Imagine when you run away from war, remember this, when you run away from war, remember you chose to love your flesh more than someone else. Remember that. When you ran away from war, you chose to love your flesh more than someone else. It could be God, it could be your family, it could be people in this church. Wow. You love your flesh that much, don't you? That's sad. That's why, if you don't believe me, then why is divorce sky high? Whoa. Oh, I love you, I love you. No, no, no. You love your flesh. You want to satisfy your flesh. I could park it right there. We, our generation is so messed up that we don't know how to war. And that mentality of we don't know how to war has affected us where we refuse to sacrifice and it distorted us even our own love for one another. And we don't even know how to love. We think love is what you see on a TV screen. That's sad. Verse 5. Verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. My fifth point is our generations forgot their alienation. 
Our generations forgot their alienations. You know what happens is when you don't have someone you love to fight for and you choose to love your flesh, what happens as well is, remember, you don't have enemies in your name list. So because of that, what happens is when the enemies cuddle to your consumer's desire or meet the flesh, what happens then is your tendency is not to alienate from that, but to rather unite with that, to not see what's a problem with that. It's sad. I, people online so messed up with so many wrong doctrines and quasi watered down churches They don't understand when I kick wrong doctrine. You know why? They think that, well, we all agree on the fundamentals. Say, fellow brother and sister in Christ. So why would you bash that person? See, that's how much they so used to uniting, getting along, putting up with people. No, there's got to be a fear and like, whoa! But you don't do that. You stay subscribed to them. You don't do that. You hop around church to church. You don't do that. You, as much as you hang around with your Bible-believing friends here, you hang around with your worldly friends. See, that's what happened to you. You refuse to alienate. You, 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 you start to go, what's wrong with the Hivite right there? I mean, that Hivite said that uh, he loves Jesus like I do. They pray over their meal like I do. That Hivite's okay. There goes that, what's wrong with the parasite? Oh, that parasite, you know, maybe doesn't serve Jesus as much, but that parasite has a point. My Bible-believing church and my Bible-believing pastor is too legalistic. I'm starting to agree with this parasite right here. And then pretty soon, all the Canaanites. Oh, you know, changing gender, but you know, that person helped me out with my homework assignment at college that time. Help me out when I was in a bind. That Canaanite is fine. And the liberal, okay, but liberals need Jesus too. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to preach at them and just those liberals through my outward testimony. Maybe one day they'll see Jesus with me. And then you embrace all the Canaanites. That's what happened. You know why? You, you ref- all the way at the beginning, you don't know war. You don't know war. And it's not just people, it's even objects and ideals. Objects and ideals that you have in your home, what's swimming in your mind every time, and a wrong thought comes in, an ideal that goes in. And that wrong ideal, if you're not careful, will make you question God, will make you turn against your own friends and families, and your fellow brother and sister in Christ, it'll make you turn against God. You know why? You entertain that thought. Oh, you're miserable. It's too hard. Don't you serve Jesus enough? And you uh, entertain that thought. You didn't alienate from that and say, you're a parasite. Stay away from me. Name the enemy. Get rid of that Amorite. Cut down the Jebusite. My... Six point, our generations forgot their animosity. Our generations forgot their animosity. Look at verse six. Look at verse six. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. <laughs> My goodness, look at them. Now, they're, now they chose to love them. I'm going to marry you. We're going to be one together. That's, that's dangerous. We're, gonna, we're two flesh becoming one. One together. That's dangerous now. Now you love the world. What did the Bible say? Love what? Love not the world. You know why you don't fight? You love too much. You need to hate. Yeah, that's good. Okay, you're not going to like this, all right? Call it hate speech or whatever you want, but this is biblical. Animosity. You need to hate. That's why you don't fight. You chose to love. I'm not telling you to be hate mongers and hate everybody and wish them that they all go to hell, anybody who disagrees with you. No, 
There is a love and a side and a compassion for souls where you want them to get saved. But we drowned and overemphasized so much on that lovey-dovey stuff that we settled down with the Canaanites and tolerated the Canaanites and choose to adapt to their culture and then somehow through our li outward life, we will bring them to us. No, they're bringing you to them. You need to have a hatred. And I'm not saying being a hate monger of people, but don't you hate wrong doctrine? That's why you get upset at me teaching because you don't share the same hatred with wrong doctrine that I do. Do you hate uh, people? Uh, do you hate it? Do you, uh, do you hate sin? Do you hate sin? That's why you're, you're going to fight it. You're going to fight it and not give up fighting because I hate you so much. I don't want you to control my eyes, my mind, my speech, my conversation, my life. Do you hate the world? What's, what's wrong with having that in the house? What's wrong with saying it this way? What's wrong with dressing this way? What's wrong with that kind of music? Do you hate the world? Do you hate the world? No, the screen glamorizes the world. And that's why you chose to un become one with it in marriage. You married that screen and said, this is what real happiness in real life is like. It's what I saw in movies and video games. I wish a life like that. You married. You need to hate. You know what? Do, do you, uh, you know what will get you out of your depression? If you recognize depression is your enemy and you named it and you hate it. You hate it so much that Man, I'm going to fight with all my might against depression. I'm going to find anything out there that can give me the joy of the Lord out there. And I refuse to cry. Get up out of your bed and go out there and then try to be happy in the Lord. Sing a hymn. Win a soul to Christ. Read the word. Or just go out and play golf. I don't care. But the problem is you don't hate depression. You need to hate depression so much that you fight against it with all your might. Oh, it's so hard, but it's so difficult. Do you hate depression? Do you really hate depression so much? Then put up a fight Amen. and stab it in the heart. Yeah. Every time depression fills, your, fills up your heart, stab it again. You don't, you, get, you give depression a break, man. You withheld your sword from blood. And then you're, you stab it once and you're like, okay, that's good enough. And then depression comes back again and you let it breathe and you let it recover and then you let it grow and then you let it overcome you again. No, you know what you need to do? Ah, 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 just die, die, die. Cut off its head. Well, it keeps coming back to me. A devil, a snake, uh, is a hydra. When you cut off a head, five more will pop out. Cut it! Cut it! Come in! Come in! One, two, four, amen! You need to have a hatred. Hatred against your pride. Hatred against the weakness of your flesh. Character deficit. You need to have a hatred of that. That's why... And one, one day you'll understand why we're so hard against sin one day. Why we're so hard against apostate churches one day. If you understand hatred of sin and evil and something that perverts it. Why we hate the NIV. <gasps> why we hate the NASV. Why we hate the NKJV. How dare you? How could you? See, you married it. That's your problem. You married it so much that you memorized verses off of it. You highlighted it. And then you read it as your everyday devotional. That's how much time you spent with your spouse. You married it. I got a pure, untainted book in my hand. And I refuse. I refuse whether Christians saved or not. I refuse them to pervert the word of God. I hate it. I hate it. And I hate it. I hate seminaries. I hate so-called biblical scholarship. I hate it with all my might and soul. I hate it when these idiots go out and try to do debates defending modern versions and putting down the King James Bible. I hate it. I hate it. I hate you so much. And 
And if you want to put me as a ranting lunatic against these kind of scholars, so what? Let them see the hate in me of how they pervert God's word. Son, these are cowards. I don't want them to see the hate in me, so I'm just going to keep showing love. Ah, you tolerator. Apologetics, you. Ravi Zacharias speech, you, you know. Blah, 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 blah. People go, whoa, wonderful guy. I wish you would debate like William Lane Craig. He's such a loving person, and that's why he gets messed up in Genesis 3, man. He don't think that actually happened. You know why? Apologetic mode. Yeah. Let's just mode. Let's love. Let's love. I can't, I can't just wait to kiss you. That's the kind of Christianity we live in. They forgot their assault mode. The very beginning. If they, uh, they would assault, though, if they hated. If they hated. You know what? The, like I told you before, it's so sad that the ones who are hating it are those who are acting like the jerks when they're preaching out on the streets. Those guys. Those are the ones doing it. The rebels against the current government system today. And the people's like saying, that's a bad testimony. Too bad you refuse to have a hatred yourself. That's why. Yeah. That's sad. That's sad. Why don't you be the one, huh? To be the good testimony, but to show forth the hatred of the things that, are, that pervert the ways of God. All right. You're too legalist. I'm sick and tired of that. You're too legalist. You're too legalist. You're too legalist. No, you love that thing, that wrong thing so much, whereas I have a hatred of it. Woo! Call me legalist all you want. I, it's called hatred of sin and anything that appears to be sin, and anything within close, close proximity to sin. Preach, Pastor. Verse 9. Uh, verse uh, 7 through 8. Verse 7 through 8. Our generations forgot their almighty God. Our generations forgot their almighty God. You'll notice at verse 7 through 8, the children of Israel, what? Forgot the Lord their God. You know, when you forget the Lord, and that's what's going to happen to you, you're going to forget the Lord. You forget what holiness is like. You forgot what it was like to listen to clean music. Some of you are already messed up because you're so used to listening to worldly music, even when you do shopping. You forgot what it's like to be innocent. You forgot what it was like to have the pure word of God in its hand that's only King James language that naturally comes forth out of you. You're too modernized with the modern versions. You forgot what real preaching is like. And that's why you got uncomfortable and you can't enjoy a good Bible-believing sermon. And you always feel tense and tense. You know why? You forgot it. You forgot the Lord. You forgot the Lord. And you know what God's going to do? This is scary. You know what that verse says at verse 8? God's the one that sold them. God sold his own children to the hand of the pagans. Oh, God would never do that to me. Don't tempt the Lord, buddy. Don't tempt the Lord. Yes, you might be his child, but that verse says that he can chasten the child. And chastening, you'll find out it mentions about like stripes. Don't mess with God. Yep. Don't tempt the Lord. He is gracious and merciful. That's why you're still alive. Yep. But man, every day you're gambling with his grace. He's going to sell you off. And some of you are already sold out. Some of you have been sold off by the Lord to addiction now. Wow. And now you're lost into addiction. Wow. The Lord has sold you off to worldliness, the prodigal life. That child, that prodigal son ain't coming back home. The Lord sold you off to pride that you're so blinded in preaching on this pulpit and thinking you're doing a work for God, but God sold you off to pride and you never repented of that. And these, how many pastors, 90% of pastors are going to die and go to heaven and at the judgment seat of Christ, they get nothing. But I've done so much. I preached so much for you. No, you never repented of that pride. You only preached what you wanted. God sold you off. That's scary. Some of you are sold off right now. But the devil's success is to keep you blinded from that. Make you feel like you're free. You're, you're your own man. You're your own woman. 
That's sad. Verse 9, verse 9. Notice right here, the eighth point, our generations forgot their appeal. Our generations forgot their appeal. You forgot what it's like to cry out to the Lord. Not just pray, but cry out to the Lord. Appeal. Because when you go through fighting, it's so hard. <laughs> you, know, you know, don't you take prayer as the first natural reaction that you should do? Well, fighting's so hard, Pastor. Did you pray? Did you pray? Oh, yeah, I prayed. No, no, no. Did you really pray? Yeah, Not like, Lord, help me out with this problem. No. Did you really pray? Yeah, everyone. God, I need your help. I'm going to die. And like, did you pour out your emotions to him? No, you're so used to pouring out emotions and ranting out your anger and your feelings at a different person right there. Right there. rather than God. Amen. That's your problem. Your problem is you forgot your appeal. You need to cry out to God. You need to cry out to God. Amen. That's why I cannot preach and I cannot teach without prayer. Why? I'm that dependent on God. So shoot me if I'm not that skilled to teach and preach. Because I need him. He is my all. He is my being. He's in every plan that I make in the work, in school, in people I talk to. And yes, even the one that I marry. Some you don't have God in your life on that. You don't pray. You just go by what you think is best. A natural reaction is, Lord, what do you think of that? Lord, help me out with this problem. Lord, I know you're going to turn that situation into a good thing. So I'm so dependent, reliant. I'm one with you. I'm that locked and married to you. Amen. Do you have that? No, you're locked and married with finance, humanistic goals, lust, lust sin, the world. My last point, our generations forgot their autonomy. Oh, Pastor, oh, read. Because of some brother and sister in Christ who tried to keep this church going. Because of some brother and sister in Christ who tried to keep getting souls saved. Amen. Because of some brother and sister in Christ who passed out the track. Because Amen. of some brother and sister in Christ who attended church and you did it. Because of some brother and sister in Christ who paid the money to financially support God's work, you did it. Wow. Amen. You know, the church is doing a great work, right? And a lot of fruits. But it's not because of you that's the problem. It's because of someone else. You know why this is a great church? Fellowship is so great. Not because of you. Because of somebody else. You forgot your autonomy. Oh yeah, we're conquering the gates of hell. Man, what a blessing that the church is in both the Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area. Onliners get excited. Man, Bible-believing truth is spreading. Man, appreciate it. Hey, man, where were you? Where were you, man? I had to be the only one that would go out to the world and reach them and then in this area too. Where were you? Singing your blessed assurance, eating your potluck meals all the time. It's so sad. It's so sad. Why did we have to be the only Bible-believing church here? Why do I have to be the one? Couldn't there be a couple more? You know why? Too tough for them. The field's too hot for them. I'm not saying I'm better than them because I'm just as guilty too, you know? I'm just as guilty too. There are some fights that I ran away from. But what makes me so burdened and so sad is you know, if people want to compliment me, encourage me for the good works that I did, praise the Lord for that. And, you know, I thank God for that. He, he used me unlike other people. But yeah. what grieved my heart is I'm not the only one. Yeah. If you, 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 yeah. all yeah. of you did something about it, you forgot your autonomy. One day, if... You know what's sad? The sad thing is you might be that verse at verse 7. Uh, excuse me, not verse 7. You might be that, that group of people at verse 11 where 
land is at rest 40 years, not because you chose to fight. The land had rest 40 years as long as someone fights for me. As long as someone keeps praying for me, as long as Pastor Kim keeps preaching the truth and open this church, as long as somebody else does a soul winning for me, as long as my spouse or my fellow lover keep me up for the Lord, as long as my mom and dad keep me uh, away from the world and keep, me, keep my eyes on Jesus Christ, as long as, as long as what? The devil knows that. Yeah. Wow. As long as, ah, I just have to hit that, says the devil. You don't have much longer. Do you know, do you now know war? Yeah. 